Hi, my name is Chad Beecham. And I'm Celia Beecham. We'd like to welcome you to Pelham Road Baptist Church. We've been members here for almost two years, and we have found it to be a loving family, a family that has embraced us. Even with our Methodist upbringing, we feel very much at home, and we hope that you will too. Rejoice in the Lord always, and again I say rejoice. Rejoice in the Lord always, and again I say rejoice. Rejoice, rejoice, and again I say rejoice. Rejoice, rejoice, and again I say rejoice. Rejoice in the Lord always, and again I say rejoice. Rejoice in the Lord always, and again I say rejoice. God, bless the lost, the confused, the unsure, the bewildered, the puzzled, the baffled, the mystified, and the perplexed. Amen.
I'll be reading from 1 Timothy 3, 1 through 13. The saying is sure, whoever aspires to the office of bishop desires a noble task. Now a bishop must be above reproach, married only once, temperate, sensible, respectable, hospitable, an apt teacher, not a drunkard, not violent, but gentle, not quarrelsome and not a lover of money. He must manage his own household well, keeping his children submissive and respectful in every way. For if someone does not know how to manage his own household, how can he take care of God's church? He must not be a recent convert, or he may be puffed up with conceit and fall into the condemnation of the devil. Moreover, he must be well thought of by outsiders, so that he may not fall into the disgrace and snare of the devil. Deacons likewise must be serious, not double-tongued, not indulgent in much wine, not greedy for money. They must hold fast to the mystery of the faith with a clear conscience and let them first be tested. Then, if they prove themselves blameless, let them serve as deacons. Women, likewise, must be serious, not slanderers, but temperate, faithful in all things. Let deacons be married only once and let them manage their children and their household well. For those who serve well as deacons gain a good standing for themselves and the great boldness in the faith that is in Christ Jesus. Today, I'll be reading from 1 Corinthians 14, 27 through 37. If anyone speaks in a tongue, let there be only two or at most three, and each in turn, and let one interpret. But if there is no one to interpret, let them be silent in church and speak to themselves and to God. Let two or three prophets speak and let the others weigh what is said. If a revelation is made to someone else sitting nearby, let the first person be silent. For you can all prophesy one by one so that all may learn and all be encouraged. And the spirits of prophets are subject to the prophets, for God is a God not of disorder, but of peace. As in all the churches of the saints, women should be silent in the churches, for they are not permitted to speak, but should be subordinate. As the law also says, if there is anything they desire to know, let them ask their husbands at home. For it is shameful for a woman to speak in church. Or did the word of God originate with you? Or are you the only ones it has reached? Anyone who, who claims to be a prophet or to have spiritual powers must acknowledge that what I am writing to you is a command of the Lord. Good morning. Well, back outside in my garden, that's good and bad. I feel more comfortable out here, I like it. But we also have noise. I don't know if you can hear the overhead plane you never know when Jadison's going to start running his weed eater or his blower. But we're going to take our chances, all right? It's a beautiful day. It is no secret that we support women in ministry at Pelham Road. We often say we ordain women because we baptize girls. There are, however plenty of churches which take the opposite opinion. These churches and pastors can be loud and this summer have been quite vocal. Churches like ours live out faithfully our convictions, but we do it pretty quietly. But today we start a pilgrimage. A pilgrimage needs a destination and ours is to understand why we support women as pastors, deacons, or any other role God may call them to. In Christianity, there are people who say churches like ours are being influenced by the culture and being unfaithful by supporting women in Christian leadership. That we support women because it's a cultural norm. They argue that the gospel and the New Testament have a countercultural message that men are to lead the church. So, in their way of thinking, they're faithful and we're not. What I have discovered in my journey is that the most vocal are usually the most afraid. These Christian leaders are often wrong but seldom in doubt. By listening to the Spirit, and hearing our scripture, it will become clear the first century Roman cultural stance, as well as the stance of these modern brothers, is patriarchy. 
That is where the culture was and still is. The Christian movement, even Paul's movement, was an anti-cultural message for the inclusion of women and for treating all people equally. Thus, in reality, we're the ones being faithful and paddling upstream. And they're the ones floating along with the patriarchy culture. Our first step this morning is to learn a little something about Bible translations. So here are two translations of Proverbs 19.21. See if you can notice the difference. Many are the plans in a human heart, but the Lord's purpose that prevails. Now that's Proverbs 19.21 from the, today's New International Version. And here it is again. Many are the plans in the mind of a man, but it is the purpose of the Lord that will stand. That's Proverbs 19.21 as well from the English Standard Version. The difference is easy to spot. The T NIV uses the word human, and the ESV uses the word man. So how did this happen? How did one translate the Hebrew word humanity and the other, man. I think it's important to understand that our English translations are translated by scholars with theological convictions. Thus, a translation is also an interpretation. Now, this does not mean it's impossible for us to discern the original meaning. It's not. It just means that we have to do more than read. For some perspective on these translations and the motivations behind them, I recommend highly Beth Allison Barr, a professor at Baylor University. She's been my guide for this next section of the sermon. Barr gives a helpful overview of what became known as the gender-inclusive Bible debate. According to Dr. Barr, Zondervan, and that was the publishing company, had asked their authors to avoid using masculine pronouns as generic place markers and instead use gender inclusive terms like humanity and people. So basically out with words like mankind as a placeholder and insert humanity. Now that was for their authors of their books. At the same time Zondervan was redoing their best-selling Bible, the New International Version. So where the Greek and the Hebrew were not gender-specific, where they were not gender-specific, instead of the default mankind, which had been plugged in since 1611, they were going to use words like humanity or people. Nothing so far sounds unreasonable if the text is not specific. But Susan Olsky wrote articles denouncing this practice, and 12 men led by Wayne Grudem and James Dobson met together to produce guidance for gender-related language in Scripture. They were not fans of the Zondervan approach. Shortly after this decision, the Southern Baptist Convention met in Dallas and unequivocally condemned gender-inclusive language in Bible translations. They accuse these Bible scholars of being people who do not hold a high view of Scripture, which is their mantra against anything since 1865. So by the end of 1997, the battle lines had been drawn, according to Dr. Barr. Barr writes, When Zondervan released their new translation in 2002, Grudem and others wrote scathing reviews. Before the today's New English Version was actually released, the 12 men I referenced earlier already had produced a new translation. In 2001, their version, the English Standard Version, was released by Crossway Publishers. And the English Standard Version, remember, that's the one that wants to protect these masculine pronouns. Professor Barr described it this way. The ESV was a direct response to the gender-inclusive language debate. 
Proponents of the ESV see the NIV as capitulating to modern feminism. But Dr. Barr sees this differently. Gender-inclusive language has a long history in the church, and she's willing to walk us through some of that history. Dr. Barr writes, long before either the TNIV or the ESV or even the King James Version, priests in the late medieval England were already erasing the male-oriented details from Scripture as they preached to the men and women crowding into their churches. She continues, Middle English sermons so frequently verbally translated the biblical text that I suspect many medieval people perceived gender-inclusive language to be commonplace in the Bible. Dr. Barr, Barr points out, uh, Dr. Barr points, puts a point on her research by saying, modern evangelicals denounce gender-inclusive language as dangerous. Medieval clergy used gender-inclusive language to better care for their parishioners. So the first point this morning is that translators have often inserted masculine pronouns when the writer's point is not a man or men, but people, humanity. So let's turn our attention now to a passage in the New Testament about women and women leadership. This one comes from 1 Timothy. Many people assume that 1 Timothy 3, 1 through 13, is referencing men in leadership. But Dr. Barr feels this is because we've how, of how we've mistranslated the text. Lucy Pepiate, a scholar in Biblical Greek, writes this. Whereas the Greek text uses the word whoever and anyone in 1 Timothy 3, with the only specific reference to man being in verse 12, however, modern English Bibles have introduced 8 to 10 male pronouns within the verses, and none of these male pronouns in the English Bible are in the Greek text. Here is 1 Timothy 3 from the English Standard Version. That's the version translated to defend male leadership. I have put the six added male pronouns that are not found in the original text in red. The saying is trustworthy. If anyone aspires to the office of overseer, he desires a noble task. Therefore, an overseer must be above reproach. The husband of one wife, sober-minded, self-controlled, respectable, hospitable, able to teach, not a drunkard, not violent, but Gentile, not quarrelsome, not a lover of money. He must manage his own household well with all dignity, keeping his children submissive. For if someone does not know how to manage his own household, how will he care for the church? He must not be a recent convert, or he may become puffed up with conceit and fall into the condemnation of the devil. Moreover, he must be well thought of by outsiders so that he may not fall into disgrace into the snare of the devil that's a lot of additional maleness that paul didn't include so the biblical writer does not make it male specific however the translator does but here's a bit more in verse one it says the saying is trustworthy if anyone aspires to the office of overseer, he desires a noble task. In English, he or she are one way we designate something as male or female. In the Greek language, it's the ending that makes a word male or female. The word overseer in Greek, the first time it is used, the one I just read, is in the feminine ending. It is actually female overseer in the Greek, according to Dr. Pepiate. 
The most accurate translation of the text would be, if anyone aspires to be a female overseer, she desires a noble task. Now, while this is biblical, it is not taught in many of our churches this way. Now, the next time overseer appears in the text, verse 2, now it's in the masculine form. And the best translation here would be male overseer. If Paul wanted to make sure that we knew that both men and women should be leading alongside each other, this is exactly how you would write it. Paul highlighted both female and male leaders in the text. If you are looking for an English translation that has translated these verses in the spirit of the original, you need to plan on looking for a while. So Paul was not a chauvinist, not the one I thought he was, but the translator, well, that's a different story. Now another passage which is used to support all male leadership in the church is 1 Corinthians 14. Let your women keep silent in the churches, for it is not permitted unto them to speak, but they are commanded to be under obedience, as also saith the law. That's chapter 14, 1 Corinthians, verse 34. This is a passage the literalists use to say women must remain silent. Scholars have long argued that the voice here does not sound like Paul. The writer, just three chapters earlier, 1 Corinthians 11, you can look this up, advises women, when you pray or prophesy, cover your head. You're not forbidden to speak. Just follow the customs and have your head covered. That's what chapter 11 was. So you can understand why some think this voice in chapter 14 that says, be quiet, does not sound like the same one who wrote chapter 11. Of course, what students of the Bible are thinking when we say this is that some later editor added to Paul. This means that they put in Paul's mouth more tolerable words. Charles Talbert offers another perspective. Maybe it does not sound like Paul because Paul is mocking another source. So maybe there's not an editor cleaning up Paul, but Paul is mocking a third party. Now what I'm about to read you is from Cato the Elder, who was a Roman senator, all right, in about this age. Cato, a Roman senator. Listen to his language. If each man of us, fellow citizens, had established that the rights and authorities of the husband should be held over the mother, of his own family, we should have less difficulty with women in general. Now, at home, our freedom is conquered by female fury. Here in the forum, it is bruised and trampled on because we have not contained the individuals, so we fear the lot. Indeed, I blushed when, a short while ago, I walked through the midst of a band of women. I should have said, what kind of behavior is this, running around in public? blocking streets, speaking to other women's husbands. Could you not have asked your own husband the same thing at home? Are you more charming in public with others' husbands than you are at your own home? And yet, it is not fitting, even at home, for you to concern yourself with what laws are passed or repealed here. Our ancestors did not want women to conduct any, not even private, business without a guardian. They wanted them to be under the authority of parents, brothers, or husbands. Apparently, a Roman culture of this age was very patriarchy. Which is just, which is just another way of saying complementarianism. So if the church is swimming against the culture, it must be elevating the role of women much like Jesus did. So now, I'm going to read some more from 1 Corinthians 14. And you think to yourself, does this sound anything like the Roman senator, Cato? Let your women keep silent in the churches, for it is not permitted unto them to speak, but they are commanded to be under obedience, as also saith the law. And if they will learn anything, let them ask their husbands at home. 
for it is a shame for women to speak in the church. Now, Cato wrote after Paul. So it is unlikely that Paul was mocking Cato's words. But Cato was not the first or the last to write about these unruly women. Charles Talbert believes this does not sound like Paul because Paul is mocking the first century weak Roman men who were intimidated by women. But me, I'm still skeptical. Read with me a wider selection of chapter 14. We're going to back all the way up to verse 27. If any man speak in an unknown tongue, let it be by two, or at least most three, and that by course let one interpret. It's about prophecy. But if there be no interpreter, let him keep silent in the church, and, and let him speak to himself and to God. Let the prophets even speak, two or three, and, and let others judge. Yes still about prophetic or ordinances or spoken words. If anything be revealed to another that sitteth, let the first hold his peace. For ye may all prophesy one by one that all may learn and all may be comforted. And the spirits of the prophets are subject to the prophets. For God is not the author of confusion, but of peace as in all churches of the saints. Let your women keep silent in the churches, for it's not permitted in them to speak, but they are commanded to be under obedience, as also saith the law. And if they will learn anything, let them ask their husbands at home, for it is a shame for a woman to speak in church. What? Has the word of God came out from you? Or came it only to you? If any man thinks himself to be a prophet or spiritual, let him acknowledge that the things that I write unto you are the commandments of the Lord. Now, if you listen carefully, from 27 to 33, it seems that the text is about how to prophesy. Then verse 36 returns to that same thing. So, could 34 and 35 be an insertion by someone other than the author? Now here, I'm going to read it this time without 34 and 35. For you may all prophesy one by one that all may learn and all may be comforted. And the spirit of the prophets are subject to the prophets. For God is not the author of confusion, but of peace, as in all churches of the saints. Now what? Came the word of God out of you? Or came it unto you only? If any man thinks himself to be a prophet or spiritual, let him acknowledge that the things that I write unto you are the commandments of the Lord. Now to me, 34 and 35 feel like a later insertion, not the mocking that Charles Talbert recommends. But I haven't went against Charles Talbert since, well, never. Nevertheless, David Bentley Hart, the Orthodox scholar, describes this passage this way. The insertion is so awkward that it obviously interrupts a single thought. Paul exhorts the Corinthians to heed the example of all the churches in verse 33. And then in verse 36, he emphasizes his point with a rhetorical question. It is absolutely clear from the discussion on women head coverings in chapter 11 that Paul fully expects women to speak in church. Insertion or mocking, I think the result is similar. Paul, the apostle, is not saying for women to be quiet. That would be such a Roman, remember Cato, thing to say. Not a Jesus follower thing to say. Now, we started our journey this morning by learning a little more about how translations of the Bible occur. And now we have looked at two specific passages where it looks like in one case, translators, and in the second case, a later editor, did what they could to continue the Roman style of patriarchy. They did what they could 
to emphasize male leadership. Now I'm going to stop here for the morning. Sort of consider this part one of getting hold of what the New Testament really says about women in ministry and church leadership. So here's sort of the wrap up. In Christianity, there are people who say churches like ours are being influenced by the culture. That we support women in church leadership because it's a cultural norm. They argue the gospel and the New Testament have a counter-cultural message and that men are to lead the church. That's their argument. So they are faithful and we're not. What the scripture we've shared this morning reveals is actually the opposite. There were translators who wanted to preserve male leadership. There were compilers who were more influenced by the Roman way than the Christian way. The biblical authors wanted to continue the Jesus message and be counter to the culture. But time and translators have laid a layer of culture across the top of gospel freedom. The Roman cultural stance, as well as the stance of our modern brothers, was patriarchy. They were and are captives to their culture. The Christian movement was a counterculture message for the inclusion of women and the equality of all people. Thus, in reality, we are the ones being faithful and paddling upstream. And they, ironically, are the ones floating along with the culture. By the way, I fully support others' right to interpret Scripture differently than we do. The time has come to address this issue because instead of using Scripture to save and liberate, I'm afraid they're using it to oppress. We can afford to offer others who see things differently our respect, even if we cannot with integrity see it their way. We only ask, for the same courtesy to be returned to us. The biblical authors had been set free and liberated by Jesus, and they wanted to do the same. You can sense that spirit in the text, but there are always others who want to mute the liberation and offer a more socially acceptable gospel. Yet when, you, yet when we peel back their layer of corruption we can still hear the chorus of gospel freedom. Join me in the benediction. For you who feel like you are never enough, for those doubters, questioners, for those who feel unlovable, lonely, or alone, for each of us who are messy, imperfect humans, step into the refreshing river of love. Let God's mercy and grace wash over you, transforming your fear extinguishing your guilt, knowing, believing the best news ever. You, you beloveds, are extravagantly loved.
by the one whose love never ends. Thanks be to God. Go in love. Amen.